Today's program is in support of two exhibitions, Florals, Desire and Design, and The Cloth That Changed the World, India's Printed and Painted Cottons. We would like to acknowledge the support of our Royal Exhibition Circle donors in making these exhibitions possible. Both exhibitions celebrate India's mastery of the art of making and coloring cotton and supplying it to all the world for thousands of years right up to today. This is the first in a series of four chintz programs that will be held this spring and summer. Prior to COVID, an international symposium had been scheduled to bring everyone to Toronto to meet and to see the exhibitions at the same time. In lieu of that, we are delighted to bring the speakers to you in this online forum. I would like to welcome my guest for today's conversations. Jonathan Mark Kinoyer is the George F. Dales Jr. and Barbara A. Dales Professor of Anthropology at the Department of Anthropology, University of Wisconsin, Madison. He obtained his PhD in 1983 at the University of California, Berkeley and has been teaching archaeology and ancient technology at the University of Wisconsin-Madison since 1985. He has served as field director and co-director of the Harappa Archaeological Research Project since 1986. He has worked on excavations and ethno-archaeological studies in both Pakistan and India, and more recently in Oman. He has a special interest in ancient technologies and crafts, including textiles and textile production, socioeconomic and political organization, as well as religion. These interests have led him to study a broad range of cultural periods in South Asia, as well as other regions of the world, including China, Japan, Korea, Oman, and West Asia in general. His work has been featured in the National Geographic Magazine and Scientific American and on the website harappa.com. Today's presentation is a continuation of our exploration of cotton and color in India, this time going back in time to look at early evidence of its presence and use. And so Mark, thank you so much for joining us to do that today. Okay, so thank you very much. Uh, Deb for inviting me to this talk. And um, also I wanna especially thank uh, Sarah Fee as a curator. And also um, before beginning, I wanna thank the Department of Archaeology and Museums, Government of Pakistan and the Archaeological Survey of India for allowing me to work on India's sites. I also wanna thank the team from the Harappa Archaeological Research Project for the many years of hard work on the site and also my numerous colleagues and students for sharing their data and knowledge. Uh, the talk today is gonna to be focusing mainly on cotton, but I will also be presenting a few uh, details about other textiles from the Indus civilization. Before beginning, I just wanna place where the Indus civilization is. The Indus civilization is actually in what is now Pakistan. It used to be ancient India and pre-colonial India, which is where all the chintz developed. But Pakistan, is the region where most of the Indus civilization is located today. There's also uh, areas of the Indus civilization, what is Gujarat, which is Western India, and in Haryana and Punjab, which is Northwestern India. Um, but people around the Indus civilization in Rajasthan were also involved and linked to the Indus, as well as in Baluchistan, and further to Oman, to the Deccan, to the Ganga, and also even into Afghanistan and Central Asia. So all of these regions contributed to what we see happening in the Indus civilization. And we know we need to, to acknowledge their contributions. And when it comes to studying textiles, the study of textiles actually begins with the very earliest studies or for earliest excavations at the Indus cities. And these were done in the 1930s, which established that the Indus civilization was contemporaneous to Mesopotamia, to Egypt and to um, early China. And we see the development of urbanism at about 2600 BC in the Indus Valley. So excavations by archaeologists John Marshall, Madhusudu Vats, and also Banerjee at Mohenjo-daro 
discovered cotton fabrics on the silver lid of a jar. Now, this jar is now in the National Museum in Delhi. Um, but this was the first evidence for cotton fabric found in the Indus civilization. And they did some measurements on it. They were able, they were also able to identify what they think is matter. Um, it, we have not been able to determine this from later analysis, but this would have been the earliest evidence for a dye from uh, the Indus region as well. Another fabric sample had the warp and weft count of very fine threads, so really even more fine than the one that was on the silver jar. But we also have examples from Harappa and other sites which provided good evidence that the use of cotton was widespread in the Indus Valley. And this cotton is Gossypium arboreum. It's a tree cotton, which in the Greek language, people called it cotton from a tree, which sometimes gets confused with kapok, which is actually a tree that has a fluffy fuzz, but it's not cotton. Uh, even though in the 30s, the earliest cotton was thought to start in, in the Indus cities, it wasn't until the 1970s that the French archaeological mission led by Jean-Francois Jarige and his wife, uh, Catherine Jarige, uh, he was at the Musée Guimet in Paris, began excavating at a site called Mehergat. And Mehergat is located at the base of a pass that connects Baluchistan with this, the Indus Valley. At the site of Mehergat, they found burials. And these burials were um, uh, included offerings of baskets. This was even before the development of pottery and lots of ornaments. And the, many of the ornaments were very fine and would have had fine fibers inside of them. Um, these burials also had ba the uh, coiled baskets and wrapped baskets that they think were made with palm or grass fibers. In one burial, however, they discovered woven fabrics. And this was one of the most, this is the most important discovery from the site of Mehergar regarding textiles. Because this fabric demonstrates that the people of Mehergar were involved in weaving and making very fine textiles. And on, on top of that, this fabric had black and red color in it. And uh, Catherine Jaris just about a couple hours ago sent me this photograph from her uh, archive showing the uh, close-up photograph of this textile. So this is the oldest woven textile of the Indus civilization uh, from the earliest period at Mehargar dating to about 7,000 BC. We don't know what fiber it was, but fortunately another burial also from Mehargar and also dating to around 7,000 BC had copper beads. So before they were making pottery, they were still making metal objects, uh, metal ornaments such as copper, that making native copper and hammering it. And to make a thread to put the beads on, they've, they went out and probably collected wild fibers. And inside of this cut copper bead, the analysis shows that these fibers are actually cotton. And they think it's wild because the cotton fibers are of different uh, maturity. Some of it's uh, immature, some of it's more mature. So they think that people were collecting probably wild fibers. This study was done in Paris by Moulerat and published in 2002. So this is the oldest evidence of cotton anywhere in the world. And the site of Mehargar has it uh, both as woven fabrics. We, we think that would have probably been cotton as well as this bead. Later on in Mehargar, we see many figurines with ornaments and they, these ornaments would have been threaded with fibers. We also see sashes, uh, we see turbans. We see uh, elaborate headdresses that probably were made of fabric. And we can imagine that they were also wearing clothes and maybe these figurines were covered with fabrics in, during their presentations. We also have uh, details of the turbans that show patterns. And this turban on a male figure is very similar to the kinds of turbans that we see worn even today in Pakistan and Afghanistan. These are woven of cotton or of silk. This is a, a, a turban from Sindh combining silk, cotton, and silver to make a very uh, elaborate patterns. So this technology begins in Mehargar and then in the later periods of Mehargar and also at the site of Masharo, which is near, near the site of Mehargar. Now we don't have many details of how the fabrics were decorated, but by looking at pottery, I think that we can extrapolate that the, pot the, the, the textiles themselves were also covered with various elaborate designs. These are modern embroidery designs from Baluchistan, and many of them are identical in terms of pattern to what we see on the pottery 
from the site of Mehargar. Other sites near Mehargar show um, slightly different figurines. So this is the site of Naosharo. These figures show people wearing pantaloons or shalwar, uh, similar to what is worn throughout Baluchistan today. They're also wearing turbans and elaborate headdresses, which indicate that uh, the textile tradition was highly developed. Other figurines from other parts of Baluchistan have decorations on the legs, and I like to think of these as probably patterned textiles. And one tradition that is very common even today in Pakistan is a, a type of a woven cotton called susi, which has stripes of different colors, um, originally natural dyes, now with uh, chemical dyes, but also sometimes with silver thread. And they tend to be worn on pants or churidar pajamas like this lady is wearing here. Similar patterns are seen on, on other types of pottery. So there's a rich, I think, textile tradition that begins starting at 7,000 and evolving over the 4,000 to 3,000 BC, which we can identify with Baluchistan and the edge of the Indus Valley. And the cotton that would have been used is cotton, is Gossypium arboreum. This is the first domesticated or documented and also probably first evidence of domesticated cotton uh, in the world. And it is found in what is now Pakistan, which would have been ancient India. This region is where cotton originated, but it also was spread to the west, to Mesopotamia, where they tried to grow it. It didn't grow very well, but also traded it to the east, where it grows very well in Bengal, and to the south, where it grows very well in South India. Herbaceum is another species, which some people used to think that both of these were the same species, but actually they're now called two separate species. And the only wild variety of herbaceum is found in South Africa. So people think that this species originated in Africa and eventually spread north and became adopted in Sudan and Western India and then Western Asia. So it kind of spread from Africa into the Western part of India and then eventually to West Asia. Um, we have evidence of charred cotton seeds at Mehargar around 5000 BC but botanists are not able to distinguish herbaceum seeds from arboreum seeds by their shape because there's, they're too similar. So unfortunately we don't know, we can't confirm that, this is, that, that the seeds are from arboreum, but we assume. I wanna throw this map up, however, just to show you some of the important sites where gossypium seeds have been found. So Mehargar is the earliest, but we also have them from Harappa starting from around 25, 2800 BC and into the Harappan period, 2600 BC. We have them from Balakot and also from, in terms of pollen, Balakot shows evidence that they probably were growing cotton along this coast. Now, herbari herbaceum, was, if it's coming from Africa, may have also been accompanied by another species of cotton called Gossypium stoxi, which is a wild version. And today that wild version grows everywhere along the coast as a scrub cotton. People don't use it very much commercially, but it's still there. So this area is a place where two varieties of cotton probably were growing. Arboreum may be in areas of more rainfall, which is Gujarat and the Punjab and Sindh, and then also South India. And then herbaceum spreads into Baluchistan, to Central Asia, and then eventually into uh, Xinjiang and Western China. I can also point out that indigo ferra, which is the seed for the plant that produces the dye, has been found from Harappa and also from the site of Rojdi, which is in the central part of Gujarat. Um, I put in also other materials that were being traded, turquoise, lapis, shell, indicating that many trade networks were established in this region. And it's very likely that cotton from the Indus Valley was being traded back to Iran and Central Asia and eventually to Mesopotamia as a part of the trade networks that were developing at this time period. We do know that other materials were being traded. So carnelian and uh, wood and animals. We can have, we have texts from Mesopotamia that mention this. And we have clear evidence of trade with Central Asia and with Oman and possibly even Western China. Um, but when it comes to texts, Mesopotamians only refer in texts to wool and linen. They never talk about cotton until about 700 to 600 BC. And that's when they developed a new word called kidinu, 
which is the word for cotton in Akkadian. They eventually borrowed also the word for karpasa, which is the Sanskrit word for cotton. So if we get a summary, we have the Indus Valley has cotton, wool, jute, palm, linen, and silk. And Arabia has linen and wool and palm and also um, hemp and uh, cotton. So we have cotton in Arabia that may have come from the Indus Valley, but it also could have come from North Africa. Iran and Mesopotamia only refer to wool and linen. Uh, herbaceum spreads through to North Central Asia and then into Northern China. And Arboreum spreads to Eastern India and eventually into Southeast Asia and to Southern China. And cotton is recorded in China as early as 200 BC or possibly earlier. So it's recorded in Mesopotamia at 600 BC and China by 200. Um, and uh, the, in China, they call cotton based on the Sanskrit word pata, where they call it patie, paitie and tiepu, which are the Chinese versions of a Sanskrit word. Moving now, that's kind of the background and summary of cotton itself. I wanna come back to the Indus Valley and talk a little bit about what we see happening in the Indus. So Mehrgar is a nice, very important site, and it's uh, nicely located at the base of a pass. So anything moving between the Indus and Baluchistan is going to be found here. But it's not a very productive area for large-scale development of cities. Harappa, which is where I've worked since 1986, is located in the richest agricultural region of Pakistan. It is the area where most cotton is grown in Pakistan, and it also is very important for uh, trade networks because of the rivers moving north and south. So the ancient site of Harappa was probably developed as an important entrepot and crossroads for trade. And cotton, I think, may have had an important role in this. We see the development of early writing as seals and ceilings and weights as a control of trade. And this starts at around 3700 BC at Harappa during what we call the Ravi phase and then develops more into an incipient urban phase at around 2800. The uh, evidence for textiles at Harappa in the Ravi phase, we have bone tools that would have been used for weaving. We have spindle whorls, and they're found mainly in two weights categories, which suggests that different qualities of fibers were being spun. We also have extremely small microbeads made of steatite, which is a soapstone that was glazed and um, people would have had to have a fiber to put inside of them. So I, I had one of the local ladies hand spin some of the, tr the, the, tr the traditional brown cotton that's grown near Harappa. And this is one of the hand, the, the spun on a charki uh, spinning wheel. And you can see that this thread is bigger than the holes that are inside these beads. So it would have been, they would have to make even a finer thread to thread these beads. And eventually they did use silk, but at this time period, we don't have any evidence for silk. From the Ravi phase, we also have beads made of clay that have woven textile impressions on them, which indicates that the weaving technology was well developed at the site. During the Kodiji phase, we see figurines that have been painted with uh, different patterns, which I interpret as plaid. Um, and this pattern of a skirt is identical to the ones that are traditionally made in, in South Asia today, and specifically in the Punjab around Harappa. This textile is called kes, and it's dyed traditionally with indigo or madder or katechu, uh, which is a brownish color. And these are examples of the hand spun and natural dyed kes that's made, that are made in some of the workshops today in Pakistan. In the Kodiji phase, we have more variety in terms of spindle whorls with four different categories, which suggests that textile production began to be more elaborated and different fiber uh, widths and or thicknesses were being spun. Now they were probably also spinning wool with these, but cotton would have been um, or one of the other fibers being spun. Um, the place where Indus cities developed happen to be also areas which were are very important for the growing of agri for agriculture as well as for cotton. So the Punjab is a very important production area for cut for cotton. Uh, Sin is also an important region and Dola Kutch and Gujarat is also an important region. 
So the city of Dolavira is located here on an island in Kutch. Mohenjo-daro is located right in the center of Sindh and Harappa is located in the center of the Punjab. And I feel that cotton was probably one of the main fibers that the Indus cities were, were developing and using for trade, which would have gone to areas surrounding them. And that's what people would have been trading for commodities such as turquoise and lapis. At, in the Indus cities, we have figurines with uh, uh, skirts on and elaborate headdresses, similar to the ones that I showed earlier from Mahargar and Mausharo, but these are different styles indicating uh, an elaboration of the textile tradition. So Indus cities evolved along the, or emerged along the, Ind the main rivers of the Indus and the Gagar Hakra Saraswati River, two major river systems of the greater Indus Valley. And they were the ones that were stimulating and creating trade that was then linked to all the surrounding regions. This, this urban phase started around 2600 BC and continued to around 1900 BC. I should point out that it also links to Oman and we, I'll mention Oman at the very end of my talk. The cities themselves, for those of you who are not familiar with this culture, were built of fired brick with massive city walls, north, south, east, west streets. We have a monumental architecture and then also an, a writing system that we still can't decipher, uh, which we call the Indus script and seals that were used by the elites for their uh, identification and trade as well as ritual. The city of Harappa um, is, this is a drawing that I made uh, showing the different mounds and areas where we found cotton are located right here. So we have cotton seeds from a house right next to the gateway. We have also cotton seeds from the earlier period in the Northern part of the mound. And we have textile evidence from many different parts of the city. Uh, the city of Dolavira is located on an island and it's fortified in a way that suggests that it was they were worried about somebody attacking it, though we don't have any evidence that that ever happened. But it would have controlled all the trade from Gujarat, from Saurashtra and Kutch, going through this, this uh, uh, run, this uh, waterway leading to the Indus Valley. So this is a very important city that would have controlled trade from this southern region. Figurines, as I mentioned earlier, show some elaborate forms of, of clothing and decoration, uh, including skirts and headdresses. And we have some figures on seals that show women wearing patterned uh, clothing. It may be tiger stripes, or it could be uh, woven like I showed you in one of the earlier slides. And then the so-called priest king is a sculpture found at Mohenjo-daro, and this Sculpture was made of steatite and it was covered, had a cloak on one shoulder, which had trefoil designs and inside the trefoils were, was a red color. And on the outside was traces of a darker color. Uh, this is after it had been cleaned. And this is a reconstruction that I made to show what that color would be like. And I'm wearing an example of a block printed version of this that was made for a conference last year in, in Mohenjo-daro. Uh, which is made with indigo and madder using traditional ajvak printing technology. At Harappa, we found a, a bangle that would have been worn on the hand with identical patterns. So this is a trefoil of a white with a red center and then a greenish blue background, which may have been mimicking the patterns that we see on these textiles. Other, fig other uh, sculptures have um, evidence for Lauren cloaks. They probably were highly decorated and then turbans on figurines that are similar to ones worn by men today in, in Punjab. In our work at Harappa, we also had the opportunity to check some structures that had been interpreted in the past as grain grinding platforms. This was excavated by Sir Mortimer Wheeler. Um, and there are 22 of these found in this area. But in my re-excavation, I realized, I found that Wheeler never ex excavated enough and he, for, he did not notice that there was a, a wall surrounding this whole thing. So this circular platform is actually in a closed room. And you do not grind grain, you do not thresh grain, you do not process grain in a closed room because you would get silicosis and die. But it's a perfect place for making indigo dye. And after analysis of these bricks, which are very saturated with, with water and a green stain, we found a broken platform and excavated in the center and found traces of a greenish 
sediment in the center of these platforms. So this suggests to me that this may have been one of the techniques for making indigo dye that would have been used by the Indus people. Today, indigo dye is made in a technology that was done, was introduced during the colonial period, British colonial period in India. You take a pit, you throw all your plants into this pit, you thresh them for a few hours, you take the plants out and you throw them away. This is actually very wasteful. It does not take all of the indigo out of the plant, but it makes quick indigo, which is what the rulers of India at that time wanted. And Indian indigo is very high quality. So you get really good quality indigo very quickly but you also throw away a large proportion of the indigo. And in Japan, they still they process indigo with a fermentation technique, which requires three months of, of saturation with water to create indigo. So my feeling is that these platforms may have been used for a different technique of indigo production, which is saturation and fermentation, rather than the technique used today in colonial India or post-colonial India. Circular platforms are located over here. And in this area, we have a large building which earlier scholars thought was the granary. So we have threshing platforms and we have a granary. So it all made sense to them, but actually it doesn't make sense at all because those are not threshing platforms. They were probably for indigo making. And then this buildings had no evidence of grain and or grain storage. And one of the visiting uh, tourists who came from a nearby city uh, looked at it and said, hey, these look like our, our textile factory. And I said, where are you from? He said, Faslabad. You know, Faslabad is a city uh, near Harappa, and it's a very important textile production area. And he thought that these long, narrow rooms might have been used for stretching out textiles, block printing them, or drying them, and storing them. And in my excavations of this part of the, the structure, I found no evidence of garbage associated with domestic uh, living. And it suggests that these, these rooms were very carefully maintained. And this actually is only one phase of this building. So there are three phases of this building, one underneath it, this one that you see here reconstructed, and then these traces of a building that were, was on top of it. So for three su successive periods, this building was re re rebuilt and reestablished and it's probably linked to the production of, of textiles that was going on in this other area to the, to the south. If you're gonna make lots of textiles, spinning with a spindle whorl is not a very efficient way of making thread. And during the Harappa period, spindle whorls almost disappear. We hardly have any spindle whorls at all. And there are very few sizes, small size and a very large size. Now they could have had spindle whorls made of wood, or other materials that are not preserved. But we do have evidence for a copper rod, which is all that would be preserved from a spin, spinning wheel. So this is the charhi, the traditional Indian spinning wheel that's used in the Punjab today. And at Harappa, we have lots of these copper rods, some of which still have fiber wrapped around them, that I think may have been used as a part of the, spin, the spindle for a spinning wheel. We also have needles which indicate the uh, sewing of uh, fiber as well. So if you have a spinning wheel, it means that you can make very uniform threads and make them very quickly. And in this toy bed from Harappa, we have an impression of fabric on the clay, which is very uniform with no knots in it, which suggests that they were using spinning wheels to make very uniform thread and very fine thread. So I'm going to conclude with just examples of how we, what, how we find fibers in the archaeological record. They're not well, well preserved. Uh, these are SEM, scanning electron microscope images of cotton. So you can see it's very different shape than silk and very different from jute and very different from wool. So by looking at the fibers, you can tell what species it is, except that these are, these are modern fibers and the archaeological fibers look like this. So they have been decomposed. Organics are all gone, and all we have are a, a skeleton of what the original fiber was. But from that, we can identify this as being probably cotton, and we can identify the, the weave and the twists. We can look at it under the SEM and also measure them and look at the shapes and how the twists occur, and this is also uh, what I identify as cotton. We can look at impressions on clay. So this is a cotton fabric or a fabric push pressed on clay which helps us identify the, the size of the fabric 
and um, measure the, the width of the threads. And in order to do that, I've also taken modern fabrics and pressed it into clay and then burned it and charred it so that we can compare what happens to modern fabrics um, when, when we process them the way that the archeological fabrics are. And I'm gonna end with just a few slides from Oman. So this is a recent work that I've been doing in Oman, which have, we have a lot of fish hooks from a site called Ras Al Had. And you have to have a, th a string on your hook if you wanna catch fish. And most of the fish hooks have a palm fiber that was probably mercerized, but some of them have cotton on them. And we also have a bead which has the traces of a cotton fiber on the inside of it. And this is, this is the earliest evidence of cotton in Arabia. The question is, is it arboreum from the Indus Valley or is it herbaceum from Arabia? And this is something that we're still trying to figure out. So this is a close-up view of the fiber on the inside of the bead from uh, Ras Al Had. And this is an example of the mercerized cotton thread on the fish hook. When you mercerize it, you take lime and you soak it in lime to make it stronger. And that allows you to catch bigger fish with your fish fishing line. These are some of the, the detailed measurements of that. So I wanna end here with the point that South Asia, ancient India, modern Pakistan, India, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, all these countries together combine this region. Uh, was one of the most important regions for the development of textiles and cotton has always been one of the most important textiles from these regions and it connects the whole world and that's what this exhibit is about and I was really honored to be invited to give this talk and now we can open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much Mark. Uh, you have taken us on a journey um, in the exhibition, we go back to trade that was happening with Egypt uh, in the 1295 and 1495, but more in the historic period. And now we've gone back so much farther to learn that uh, India was producing cotton and also trading it uh, that early on. And I think that's fascinating. I'm gonna begin the questions with just a couple things that have come to my mind as I've been listening to you. And, and one, um, as the botanist in the crowd, or one of the botanists in the crowd, um, what is DNA evidence being used at all to try to um, identify the species? You've said that we can't tell the seeds apart. Uh, can we go further than that? Unfortunately, we can't because all of the, car the remains are carbonized. Okay. And DNA, you cannot, retract, you cannot extract DNA from carbonized material. So until we find uncarbonized seeds that date to this time period, we can't talk about DNA. And the seeds, the, so all the seeds that you have found are carbonized then? They're so carbonized, yes. Yeah, and, and what would the reason for that be? Just well, cotton, cotton seeds are removed from cotton because you want to spin the cotton, but the cotton seeds are also used for making cotton seed oil. And you okay. take cotton seeds and you process them for oil. You may take them and they may get stuck in, you may be burning some cotton um, bowls that you didn't need and you want to burn them. So they may have been charred by burning. So there are many different ways that you can char cotton seeds. So we think that the use of cotton for oil and things dates back to that time, probably. Oh, well. definitely. Probably they were using it for oil very early. Okay. So linseed oil was also, I mean, flax was used mainly for oil before it was used for fiber. Okay, that's interesting. It, uh, yeah. And I guess the uh, textile factory, so to speak, that you've found in the, and the platforms you know, indicate that this was obviously a, a central feature of things. What, what was the role probably of, of the textiles within those societies? Uh, you've shown us a lot of figurines and things that uh, show perhaps different styles of dress and things. And, and, and was, were textiles used in, in what cultural way were they used in? Well, they would, they would have been worn as symbols of wealth and power. So one of, the main, one, of, one of the main roles of textiles today is demonstrating identity and, and wealth and status. 
So when you see figurines that are naked, women don't walk around naked in the Punjab today because it's freezing cold in the winter. <laughs> and in the summer you get sunburned. So people always wear clothes. So just because the figurines are nude doesn't mean that people in the ancient in this valley walked around naked. They were probably dolls that were covered with textiles. And we have about dolls today that when you take all the clothes off, they're naked. So the clothes don't preserve, but the dolls are there. So all of those figurines would have been probably clothed with fabric as a part of their, their rituals and being used as toys. And we have some images showing people wearing clothes and cloaks. So I assume that those textiles were used in the same way. And so do we think that the kinds of patterns that they were putting on them, um, we know that um, in the historical period, uh, India was making cotton in, in patterns that were catering to the interests of the rest of the world. And from the figurines and things, do, do you think that that's probably the case, even dating back? No, I, I don't think that Harappans were making fabrics to sell to Mesopotamians in Mesopotamian, tech, in Mesopotamian form. At least we don't have any evidence for it. Okay. But we do have evidence that Indus craftspeople were going to Mesopotamia and setting up workshops there. So it's not unlikely that in Mesopotamia, there would have been textile workers who were making things for local demand in local ways. And what about um, the, so we have a good record of, of textiles at that time in, in the Indus Valley and coming down into Gujarat. And we know that later on, you know, another important area in South India What's the likelihood or, of the movement down to that er, area? I mean, so South Indian textile production, I mean, cotton could have spread there very early because we have indications of plants from South India that are tropical plants coming up into the north. So if plants are coming from the south to the north, then plants are also going from the north to the south. Right. So I think that cotton was probably being grown in South India very early. And since cotton is a cooler fabric to wear in the hot summertime, silk is very hot. And even though silk production was developing in India, uh, silk was meant, mainly used for making warm clothes. It's not good for hot, humid climate, and people tend to prefer cotton in that kind of context. OK. So we've got lots of questions coming in. So I think that I'll move. I see them. I see it. We'll, we'll move to some of these. I'll try to feed them to you as best I can here. Um, I have the. I have the. I can see the list, but I can't answer all of them. So I can go right. down them in order. So that I don't. I put the thread count of the ones that we have on the slides, and you can see another image. You can see another presentation that I'm going to give you a link to later, which has more detail. Um, I don't think we can tell how people were divided. Um, traditionally, textiles are made in the home, even today in India. So a, a merchant might own a field of cotton, but he gives the cotton to women in the home to spin. And then he takes the spun cotton back and gives it to somebody else to weave. So household production is gonna be one of the main forms, which would have been women. And um, men become involved in certain aspects of textile production. In, in terms of like weaving of uh, sardis and special embroideries for very specific commercial purposes. But I think most of the textiles would have been produced by women. Um, and I think there were specialists that work with cotton at different stages um, because the people who are raising it, the people who are you know collecting it, the people who are processing it require different uh, skills. And one of the finest cottons that we know of is grown in Bengal in the delta of the Ganga Brahmaputra, which is the um, fine cotton. It's also arboreum variety, but it only grows in a certain part of the river. And that type of really fine cotton, um, we don't know if it was present in the Indus Valley, but to spin it and weave it requires high degree of specialty. So we can assume that Indus craftspeople were also developing really high skills. In terms of other dyes, um, we don't have other details of dyes. I'm sure they had iron dyes, um, which would have been for black. Um, we, but an ochre, which is a red dye. We, we know they used turmeric for food. So turmeric might've been a dye. 
And we know that they had acacia trees. So acacia uh, katechu, which is the from the from, uh, resin from the from the uh, acacia tree, would also then be used. So there's potential for lots of different dyes. Um, do India and Pakistan collaborate reasonably well in uncovering antiquities important to both? Uh, the archaeologists do, and the, the definitely there's a lot of collaboration between the two regions, and a lot of people are involved in collaborative research. Um, next one, we have heard that the oldest known use of, of indigo is in Peru about 6,200 years ago. Could we say that the oldest known use of cotton and indigo may also have been in the Indus Valley? I, I don't like to get into the oldest things. I don't care whether it's old or not. It's what, what becomes important. So the Indus Valley has evidence for cotton at 7,000 BC, and we don't have any good evidence for indigo until much later. So, but indigo, the word indigo comes from India. And the Greeks called it that because that's where indigo was produced and shipped to, to the Mediterranean. So we know that India was a very big producer of indigo very early. Um, the next one is Gosipium. Is Gosipium arboreum um, still growing in, in Pakistan? It does grow there and it grows in different areas where, um, you know, there, it, it does grow. And there's different varieties of arboreum. Some of it's a darker brown color. So I showed you a fiber of the brown cotton, which is the, un, it's unbleached, it's a brown color, and they still grow it in some parts of the Punjab to make brown, undyed brown cotton. And I'll just add here, there's a lot of, we know that throughout India, there's a, a India in particular, and I'm assuming in, in Pakistan as well, a push to go back to using some of the original varieties since everything had been moved over to hirsutum and that proved to be not the best move at all. Um, so are a lot of the native varieties now having a revival in that area? Not, not really because they have, they're not as Im important. Stoxy, Gossipium stoxy, I just was in preparation for today's talk, I was reading up on my, my, uh, my bo bo botanical stuff and a, an article came out just last, this year that Gossipium stoxy, which is the wild variety from Africa, they're developing a hybrid from that variety, which is resistant to all kinds of diseases. And if they can hybrid that with Crisutum or with um, Herbaceum, they can develop some species that would be much more adaptable. So they're just developing some new things now. Could you give us an example of a South Indian found in the North? Of South Indian plants from the south and the north. Yeah. Um, there are different kinds of grams and millets that are found only grown in South India that are found in the Indus Valley. So um, it's a type of it's a type of dal. It's called tur dal in in English or in Hindi, and that's from South India and it's found in the Indus Valley. And we also have millets, and we also have and probably turmeric may have come from South India too. We have bananas in the Indus Valley. Bananas could have come from South India or Eastern India. Okay. Um, since the climate is changing in the Indus Valley, will cotton still be grown? I understand that cotton requires an abundance of water, and we know that water has been a problem throughout the subcontinent. Well, water is only a problem because people don't maintain it properly because <laughs> it rains very heavily at certain times of year. and um, the reason they don't grow as much cotton today around Harappa as they used to is because sugarcane has taken over and the sugarcane mafia takes over all the fields and grows it with irrigation water. And so that's why they don't grow cotton now. So Harappa cotton mills had to close down because the sugarcane people came in and took over. So it has to do with politics and um, the economics of who gets to sell what for how much. But Pakistan is still one of the biggest cotton producers. I am wondering if the beads might have been threaded on fine threads or leather or gut, or would animal products have been taboo? The, the, the diameter of the hole of the, the beads are between one and 1 1.2 millimeters, some of them. 
And so they're very, very small and animal fibers are not, animal, um, like the leather and gut is, uh, doesn't work. It breaks because they're using water to, to grind it, uh, the beads. And so basically they would have been uh, plant fibers. And cotton works as well as silk. And just to add there, Mark, it looked like an awful lot of the, the preservation going back to the early discovery of cotton on the silver and then all that you found on copper. Are the metals helpful in, in preservation? Yeah, copper salts and silver salts work best. Uh, iron does not work very well because iron eats away the fibers, but cotton and, and silver and bronze uh, work well to preserve textiles. They pickle them basically. Okay. Um, another question here, please tell us more about those um, brick structures stained green, how wide and how deep they are they? Um, I can't, don't, don't ask me the details there, but they're, they're about a meter and a half in circumference. The hole in the center is about um, nine inches or nine, 15 and 20 centimeters. And it's been dug out many times. So uh, we can see that people have repeatedly cleaned out the center hole to get whatever is in there out. And after, this, after these structures were abandoned, somebody came and dug from above to try to find them and then dig out the bricks and dig out the clay that was associated with them to collect that sediment. So they were being, this is the Harappans themselves, ancient Harappans. We're right. trying to find these structures and basically looting them and taking that clay that was associated with them out. So that's what led me to think that they might be made for indigo. And I was thinking, again, is there any way of analyzing that? Would there be anything left in the soil that you could analyze? To I have been trying to find somebody to do it for 30 years and I'm <laughs> almost there. I have the samples. That's great. That's I have the samples. The problem with um, chemicals is that they decompose and reconstruct themselves in different ways in the soil, depending on what happens in the so sediment. And Punjab is not a great place to have chemical preservation in free soil, but it could be in pottery. And so we're looking in pottery as well. Um, here's another one. Any evidence to suggest cloth was used for banners or architectural or fur furniture coverings? We don't have any evidence, um, so we can't say for sure. Okay. We know that they had banners. Sorry, there, we have banners that would have been, could have been textile, that they could have also been woven mats. So we have one banner from a procession. Okay, and that would be consistent with other ways that uh, we know they were making later on. Um, another one about the copper and silver, the fibers in the copper and silver, are they what we call pseudomorphs? People call them pseudomorphs, but they are not really, they, they, it's, sometimes they can be pseudomorphs, but sometimes they are actually the pickled fiber. So a pseudomorph means it is the shape of the fiber replaced with some other material, but in some contexts, they are actually the fiber that has been pickled by the metallic salts. And do you think that the, um, like in the case of the silver container, um, would it have been holding the textiles or would the textiles have- It was wrapped, it was wrapped them? in textiles. Okay, so, so protective mechanism. It was probably wrapped in textiles and buried and then because where the textile was touching and then water touches that, then it corrodes and that is how it preserves. Okay. Um, is there any information available as to the value of cotton in the currencies at the time? We have no way of testing that or finding that out from the Indus. We do know that um, from the Arthashastra, what, during the third century, second century BC, the development of the Mauryan Empire, a text was developed that um, talks about the importance of textiles. And the Arthashastra is one which kind of classifies which textiles are more valuable than others. And then the Manava Dharma Shastra, which is another text that was developed, which included punishments for people who were stealing things or doing different things, talks about different you know, ways of value. So wool, some wools were very, very valuable. 
and then we have silk as well, and then cotton. Um, hemp is going to be the lowest. So wool, wools were the finest, the finest wools like shatush, which comes from the chiru antelope in, in, in Tibet and Nepal. That was probably the highest value. And then you have fine wools and then coarse wools and then cotton. And cotton would have been a more common cloth. Um, one more here and then I'm going to finish with one myself. Are there any other known examples of Indian cotton between Indus Valley and those found at Bernaki? Bernaki. Um, between the Indus Valley and Bernaki, I don't know. I don't know of any. There should be, but <laughs> we just haven't found them. <laughs> but haven't found them yet. Um, so the lovely shawl you're wearing and the design that was on the priest king. Um, that, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating design. Um, do you think that, um, what are the significance of some of these things? And as, as someone who has done a lot of looking at floral patterns on these things, are you, is there evidence of any of that? A lot of what you showed were geometric designs and things, the one that you are wearing is less like that than anything else. And, and um, well, this, is, this design is referred to as a trefoil and the trefoil is associated with a star, star pattern in Mesopotamian. It's re referring to the sky, okay. not flowers. Okay. So and in Mesopotamian a... and in Mesopotamia and in Egypt on, on cattle, this symbol was carved and there are cattle sculptures that have this symbol on it. So certain cows, bulls had a spotted pattern on their hides. And sometimes they were probably dyed with hen, henna to make mm -hmm. that pattern. And that reflected a sky pattern related to a sky deity. Okay, so and they might have had ceremonial and, and also religious significance. Ritual, it's ritual. This pattern is block printed, but the one that the priest king is wearing is not block printed. They are not repeating. They are uh, they they have circles and trefoils, and they're not in a repeating pattern. Okay, and it looked like it was embossed as well. Right? Well, that's because it's carved in stone because it was okay. meant that it's meant to be flat. But um, many people thought of it as being block printed. It could be block printed, but not in a repeating pattern. So it could be block printed in a non-repeating pattern. <laughs> right. So. Okay. Or it well, could be applique, or and, embroidery, or or painted, or painted. And is there evidence of of much painting from that part of the? We don't have anything preserved except for one mural on a wall in Mehargar, which is done in red with some dots. So we don't have a lot of murals or things like that. Okay, well, thank you, Mark. This has been enlightening and it's great to see the early evidence of, of cotton production and all of the exciting work uh, that you are doing there. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining us for this program. I only wish that it had been as we had originally intended and in person. Uh, COVID has uh, stopped us all from traveling, but uh, I am hoping that you maybe be able to see the exhibition before uh, it closes. Um, but for those of you, and I say that for everyone, and for those of you who have not seen it, I would put the um, catalog to your attention. Uh, these are available on the web and elsewhere, and this is a wonderful uh, testament to the exhibition with many, many authors who have uh, written on specific subjects all related to Indian chintz. As I said earlier, this is the uh, first of four lectures that will be given uh, through the course of the summer, and we'll be giving you more information about those. Um, there's a, a very interesting lineup uh, that we've just put up on the screen here for you. And so I would um, encourage you to please come back and continue this journey of understanding um, all of the fascinating history of India's uh, painted and print printed cottons.
So thank you so much for joining us, Mark. Thank you again for joining thank you me. so much. And uh, I would also like to tell everyone that uh, Mark has very kindly provided us this a link, which I believe Aaron has put up for you, uh, to both to this presentation and then there will be a link to a longer presentation uh, that is available at the Harappa website, um, which goes in, e into even more fascinating detail uh, on his work at Harappa. So I wish everybody a wonderful afternoon and thank you so much for joining us. Bye.